I dropped her off for a work trip, only to find her in Vegas with our doctor this Christmas. I'm exposing her affair in front of our entire family. I have worked my crap off to finally be debt-free and two years away from retirement. She tells me she is in Arizona for an educator's conference she is required to attend. I dropped her lying crap off at the airport with plans to pick her up Thursday. A co-worker of mine is in Vegas for a PBR event. He sends me a picture of her in a casino with our primary care physician. So, it's Christmas and all the kids are coming here. I have looked forward to hunting with my son and grandsons. So I don't know if I should blow the thing to hell or play it cool until after Christmas. I guess I could gather more evidence if I just pick her up and act as if all is well. I am not sure I can do that, but the other choice is to devastate my children at a terrible time of the year. This tramp sang a solo in church Sunday before she caught a flight on Monday to spend the week effing the doctor. I have never suspected her cheating in over 40 years of our relationship. I damn sure never have. I guess the life I was so secure in is over. So I am glad my parents are not here to see this. I may just catch a flight tomorrow and find their crap. Probably use different names. The hell of it is both my brothers are dead and there is nobody I can tell this crap to. Maybe the pastor. Hell, she is probably blowing him too. Update 1. I hired a lawyer and a pie this afternoon. We all met at the lawyer's office and they both advised me on the course of action to take. So I arranged for her sister to pick her up tomorrow and I am at my camp for a few days. So far I have been able to keep from telling her I know what she has done. It is hard not to confront both of them, but if I can keep from it, I will be better able to protect myself, plus gain more evidence. I can't sue him for alienation of affection, however I intend to ruin his future. Update 2 I'm going home tonight. My mother-in-law is 84 and has been widowed for 12 years. She will be devastated by my wife's cheating. My wife has three married sisters who are all in long-term marriages. So they are coming to our house for Christmas tomorrow night. I have grilled steaks for them since my father-in-law died every Christmas. So if I don't go home for this it will raise red flags for her. I considered faking the flu and staying here. I decided to just go home. If I don't go home it will affect the plans to come back with my son and grandsons. I have not confronted her. We have talked some but mainly have texted. I am positive she suspects nothing at this point. I gave the code for gate and house to PL. He took an IT guy and was able to access her desktop while she was at work. Some way he is receiving her texts now from my cloud. I don't really understand how he was able to accomplish this, but he did. I am not in contact with the PI or lawyer every day. I have no idea what all he has been able to find. I have an appointment to meet with him and my attorney next Friday morning, one week from tomorrow. It is hard enough for me to control my anger with what I know now. I believe I am spending unnecessarily at this point for PL. However, the attorney wants me to continue to gather evidence until I confront her. I plan to get what he is next week and be able to quit paying him. I always go to camp the week before and after Christmas. She will suspect nothing if I can hold off slapping the crap out of her when I get home. I will leave again Sunday. My son and grandsons are scheduled to hunt the week before Christmas as we do every year. So I have not seen her in almost two weeks. I never thought the love I had for her could turn to this much hatred and contempt. My plan is to gift wrap the evidence I get next Friday. After Christmas lunch we will open gifts with our children and grandchildren. So I am going to let her open hers last, tell her to show our children, take her phone, and leave. So my next stop will be the doctor's house where I will deliver the evidence to his wife and family. I will then file for divorce on the grounds of Intai. Thanks for allowing me to share my story real time. It is the only outlet at this point I have. Update 3, I came home from the camp last Thursday evening. She was home. I was exhausted from not being able to sleep, and our conversation was minimal. Friday night we had our Christmas gathering with her mother and three sisters at our house. So I was able to pull that off without her suspecting anything. Saturday was gone most of the day, and after church Sunday I returned to my camp. So my son and grandson met me, and my oldest grandson there Sunday night. We hunted all week, and I have returned home tonight. We have no plans for tomorrow. Our children and grandchildren will attend church with us, Sunday, and then come here for Christmas lunch and gifts. I have been able to control my emotions in a manner no one has suspected the life-changing situation I am in. I have reconsidered the to use to reveal her affair. I am not going to confront her on Christmas. I have an appointment with my attorney Tuesday morning. I intend to get all the evidence he and the investigator have gathered, along with the divorce papers he has drawn up. 
I intend to have my son and two daughters come to our house for a family meeting and expose her affair to them as well as confront her at the same time. I want to do this Tuesday night. I am not sure at this point how I will confront the doctor and his wife. My intentions are to destroy his reputation and career through any means available to me. Thanks for your messages of support. Update 4 We made it through Christmas with my children grandchildren and in-laws. Monday morning I went and saw my pastor and told him the situation. He facilitated a meeting with me and AP's wife. He agreed to confront our spouses on Monday night requiring them to write a detailed letter of the affair. So I did and did not allow my wife to say anything to me. I told her I knew she was in Vegas and who she was with. So I told her to write the letter of detail and if there was any contradiction to evidence I had there with no chance of reconciliation. Tuesday morning I met with attorney and obtained evidence collected and received advice from my attorney. Tuesday afternoon met with APZM's employer demanding he be terminated. He was today. Tuesday night my children came and their mother told them what she had done. They are shocked and hurt. So my wife went home with my daughter and remains there still. I am trying to decide my best course of action. I see no path to reconciliation. I will determine what other action to take with AP after I'm sure of what I need to do with my own marriage. She confessed to everything and gave an answer for every specific detail I required in her letter. Thanks for your well wishes. I am doing fine considering where I am. Update 5 I am going to try to answer your questions. So did you ask her why? Of course I asked why. She said she didn't know why. She described to me and my children that she felt like an addict. She knew she was destroying her life, but would not stop. She told our children, no child should ever have to be disappointed or embarrassed by their mother's immortality. That they didn't deserve the shame of a tramp. I am not going to say all she has said to me, simply because I don't know if any of it is true. 2. How did she act? She is completely destroyed, remorseful, begging for forgiveness from me and children. She does understand what she has done. 3. How did my children react? By one telling her, and the other two agreeing, it would have been easier to bury you than this. 4. Do I want to be married? Sure I do. That's why I didn't ever cheat on my wife. 5. Have I met the AP's wife and told her? Yes, we have met twice, communicated by phone and text several times. 6. Do I not care for his family by having him fired? I care more for the next patient's wife he gets a hard on for. 7. Am I divorcing her? I don't know. 8. Have I sought therapy? Not at this time. What I need is for this to go away. If you know of anyone that can make that happen, by all means I will do therapy. I can tell you that every situation is unique in its elements, personalities, and complexities. I could and would have dealt differently at a different time of my life than I am now. It is very easy to know just what to do when you are behind a keyboard. Some of you are keyboard experts, but are not very skilled in advice. Some of the comments you have made are without you knowing every nuance I am dealing with. Others have been a great source of strength. One Redditor has been a valuable source of wisdom, knowledge, and encouragement to me. He has helped me in more ways than I will even try to thank him for. It is very strange of my personality to have found such a kindred spirit with an anonymous soul. That is about all the questions I remember, but I'm going to browse some subs for a while so hell. Just ask me whatever you want to know. It ain't like I got to spend quality time with my wife. She ain't chair. Oh yeah, why is she at my daughter's and not my in-laws? Her dad is dead. Her mom is 84. What the hell? I don't want her mom to have to deal with this BS. She is at my baby daughter and her husband's home. They have no children yet. The chance of her turning any of my children against me does not exist, but that is especially true of this little spitfire. She is 10 years younger than her sister and 12 years than her brother. She has spent more hours in a deer stand, bay boat, office, truck with me than we could even begin to count. She won't even let her say the true things that are bad about me, much less lies. The first text was him asking her, how does it feel to be the most beautiful person in any room you enter? This was referring to a funeral we had all attended. I don't either. My sister-in-law told me my mother made a comment to her when my wife got Brit implants about 30 years ago. My mother said she will be showing those new craps to someone else. I don't think I can ever get over her getting on her knees and blowing him. She is a beautiful woman who has been told that all her life, but time is starting to show and she can't handle that. She has done well in staying ahead of it, but it's a race everyone loses. I did not tell my wife what I was going to do about anything. I assume she does not know. My daughter said her phone is dead and she has not had any communication with anyone but our children. I don't know for sure if she knows or not. 
The AP's wife called me when she learned he was fired and said she was going after my wife's job. So I told my wife when I confronted her the AP's wife knew and was requiring him to answer by letter the same questions as I asked her. Update 6. I had a brother who was 14 years younger than me. He was a college professor and lived eight and a half hours from our hometown. He died in a motorcycle accident in 2017. He left one daughter who is now 24, married, and lives in another state than her mother, but has brought her new baby home to see her mother and in-laws. So my sister-in-law has never remarried. I called my sill last night to find out when my niece was going back home. She is actually staying this week with her husband's parents who are about 40 minutes from my sister-in-law. So my children are smothering me, so I am taking a road trip. I am going to meet my great-nephew, who is named after my brother in me. I will arrive late tonight. I asked her to reserve me a hotel room, to which she replied, There is no way in hell that's happening. You will stay here, and we will watch movies and eat ice cream. I don't know when I am coming back. I have not spoken to, seen, or communicated with my wife since Tuesday night. I have blocked her number. I called my son and told him where I was going, and for him to go by the office and lease a rental property my company owns. It is a house renters moved out of and has been completely renovated with the intent to sell. I told him to inform his mother to come and get what she wanted needed from our house and move in the rent house. She is to pay rent to my son, who will pay my company. I am having new keypad installed on gate and doors to my house Wednesday, so if she needs her stuff, now is the time to fetch it. Update 7 When I called my sister-in-law I told her I would be coming alone to see my niece and her new baby. She asked me why my wife was not coming, and I just said there are some issues I will tell you when I get there. I got here around midnight, and she had just took a hot pound cake out of the oven. So it was the best thing I have eaten in weeks. I gave her all the details of my saga. I have teared up a few times, but as I went through all of it with her I broke down and wept. She was very supportive and wept with me. She stroked my bursted ego, and I guess I felt better after we talked. I went upstairs to bed about three o'clock yesterday morning. Yesterday morning she cooked me bacon and eggs for breakfast, and as I ate she told me that I may make the rules and run the show back home, but not at her house. She then proceeded to tell me my schedule. 1. At 1 o'clock I had a haircut appointment. I needed a haircut when this all happened, and it was overdue so I agreed. 2. After the haircut we were going to Dillard's and buy some clothes that fit me. I have lost over 30 pounds in three weeks. 3. I was going to go with her to a friend's house that was having a bonfire and fireworks for a little while last night. 4. I was going to go with her to church today, and she was going to go visit her parents this afternoon. 5. She is cooking supper tonight, and her daughter and son-in-law are coming to eat and visit. 6. Her son-in-law is taking me deer hunting tomorrow with dogs on an 8,000-acre timber co-lease he is a part of. He is off all week and if I want to I can stay and hunt all week if I want to, and she will wash my clothes and feed me. I have never done it, so I don't know what to expect. 7. So we are not going to talk about my problems again until I leave to go home. So hell, I did what I was told to do. She went with me to her regular salon. On the way there she said I'm going to use you to have some fun. When I introduce you, I'm going to give them your first and middle name. I asked her what the hell and she just laughed and said just play along. I am going to give these tramps something to talk about. My middle name is my mother's maiden name, and that's how she introduced me to her hairstylist. During my haircut she asked me where I was from, and I told her Detroit. There is no way my accent would allow me to be from Detroit. My sister-in-law never missed a beat and said he's a logger. Next stop Dillard's. I have not been shopping for anything in years. Wound up buying three new pants, four shirts, two pairs of shoes, a tie, can you believe 75 for a tie? And a heart, Schaefer, Mark suit. According to her, it is the only suit my brother would wear. So I did not know he was so peculiar about his clothes. I also bought a new belt. The suit had to be hemmed, and she convinced them to do it while we waited. On the way home, she told me I was going to be her date for the party in church, so I was. She told me to look at her like I looked at a new gun so they would buy it. I went along with her, except at the party I was from Atlanta, and I sold road graders and had been married and divorced four times. At church this morning we got there late and left early, because she doesn't want to be struck by lightning for lying in church. She sat right up under me, and gelled my hand when we walked out. I have had a good time looking like dumb, and dumber with my 46-year-old sister-in-law. 
She has cut up the whole time, and I have laughed, genuinely laughed. I have not done that for three weeks. I am going to hunt tomorrow and may stay until Wednesday, but I have to be at work Friday. I have talked to my son a couple of times. He thinks they need to try to get her some medical help. She evidently is not saying much and stays in her bedroom at my daughter's house most of the time. Her phone is dead, and he and my other daughter communicate with her through my youngest. The AP's wife sent her a long text in which she called her everything but a child of God. I have not communicated with my wife. She asked where I was, and told my daughter I would never be able to forgive her, and she didn't blame me for not forgiving, so my son said she looks like death. I still see no path to reconciliation, however I'm not going to file for divorce until I'm completely sure. Some have said divorce and reconcile if I change my mind. That seems like a waste of time, energy, and money. So when I decide to divorce it will be final. I also am not going to sue AP if I don't divorce. If I do divorce I will sue him to defray what the divorce settlement will be, otherwise I don't want his money. I have come to terms with the fact this is not going to end soon, and that my life will never be the same. I started keeping a journal today, I have realized it helps the order of my thoughts by writing them down. Thanks again for your encouragement, it has helped me. Update 8 My daughters took my wife to ER yesterday morning. She was dehydrated. Tests showed her kidney function was not what it should be. She was exhibiting signs of confusion, she was admitted drip started, and labs will be done again today. A psych evaluation has also been ordered for her. They were told to expect her to be in hospital for most of the week. So my son contacted her sisters and told them she was hospitalized and that I was out of town. Her sisters and mother are unaware of her affair to my knowledge. I plan on going and sitting down with her mother and oldest sister this weekend. So looking back I should have done that this past Friday before I left town. I am still at my sister-in-law's house. Spark plug. So I hunted yesterday, but it is raining today and I opted not to go again this morning. So last night a menu was fried steak, mashed potatoes and gravy, homemade biscuits, apple cobbler and ice cream. She had a couple of things to do this morning, but has instructed me to be dressed when she gets back and be ready to do some rambling, whatever that means. I told her rainy days were good for two things and I wasn't sleepy. She came back with, your children don't need both of their parents in hospital from dehydration. So I am going rambling, I guess. I am glad I am here. I really don't want to talk to my friends just yet, nor do I want to be at work. I have my laptop and phone, an assistant co-worker that has been with me 25 years, so business is being conducted as usual. He is aware of the affair because he was the one who made me aware of the Vegas trip. While hashing all of this out on Reddit has been helpful to me, you are tiring of my posts. I have started a journal and can just write there if you have lost interest in my story. Thanks again for all of your messages. Many have been very thought-provoking and helpful. My mind is in the clearest place it has been since the text I received of her and AP partner. Thanks in no small part to you. Update 9 I called her sister and gave her a basic summary of the affair and what led to hospitalization of my wife. She was genuinely shocked and profusely apologetic and sympathetic. My mother-in-law is leaving tomorrow morning on a trip with three other widows she is friends with. My daughters call it the Bay Gang, Blue-Haired Ho. They like to take bus tours. She said she was not going to tell her about the affair, nor psych evaluation just that my wife's condition did not seem serious enough for me to return home from trip, that I was with others, and that would have to return with me, and it was not necessary for me to come as of now. She also said my mother-in-law was very worried about me when they left my house, that I did not see myself and looked very troubled. The sisters are going to help my daughter-in-law with hospital stay, and one of them will take her home with them until she is able to move from our house. I called my baby daughter and told her to go by the office and get a check go cash it, buy a card, and take it by her grandmother's house. I have a name stamp at office she can sign the card with, to put a note in it to enjoy her trip and that I loved her. So, thanks again for Reddit catching something that I needed to do I had not thought of. Update 10, turns out rambling included grocery store, dry cleaners, pay electrical bill, home depot, and not least, a test at a clinic. $112 and 15 minutes later I learn, I have no STD. Spark plug in a very matter of fact manner explained to me, ain't no man with a junky monkey staying at my house. So, for those of you advising me to go through this humiliating experience, rest easy. I am clean. My wife's kidney function has improved, but according to a psychiatric evaluation, she has a psychotic break. She is confused about where she is and believes she and I were involved in a traffic accident and I am dead. She is upset my funeral was held without her. 
She is crying and mumbling things they can't understand. Tonight they moved her to a hospital specializing in mental trauma. They expect she will fully recover in days or weeks. She can have no contact with anyone for ten days. My middle daughter is going to be the family contact for afternoon updates until she can be visited. What an unbelievable, unnecessary mess this has been. I am still at Sparky's and she scheduled me a 9.30 appointment in the morning with a psychiatrist she saw for two following my brother's tragic death. I came up and got my shower. When I was putting on my pajamas to go back downstairs, I discovered all of my perfectly good white fruit of the loom boxer shorts were gone. They had been replaced by boxer briefs from Duluth Trading Company. The band around each one says Go Buck Beard. They are red, black, neon blue, maroon, and dark and light gray. When I asked her about it, she said the 60s called and wanted them ugly drawers back. Plus the boy's next brief. Update 11, I returned to my home Thursday night. I had an appointment Thursday morning with a psychologist my sister-in-law used following the death of my brother, her husband. It was not a good meeting. In all fairness to the counselor, I went into it reluctantly and was very angry at the time. I felt very uncomfortable discussing the details of my wife's affair with her. I had to be at work Friday for a contract addendum meeting that required my presence and signature on a modified agreement. I met with my children Friday afternoon to discuss their mother's status. The clinician requested we submit a plan for her discharge to help them fully prepare her and her treatment. I remained firm she couldn't return home to live and they should prepare her to move into a rental property. Her status report today was encouraging in the progress she made over the weekend. They are also wanting sessions with her family as early as their ease the end of this week. I explained to my children I would not be attending any family sessions. I expressed to them her recovery was not on me, and I was not going to participate in it. I am not sure they fully agree with my approach, but that is the approach I am taking. I did commit to not filing for divorce in the next six months. I went to church Sunday and sat where we have sat for nearly 40 years. None of the AP's family was there, and I didn't inquire of my pastor as to their status, because I don't give a damn. I met this afternoon with a physiologist recommended by my pastor. It was a productive meeting for me. He is 74 years old. He works part-time from office behind his home. He explained to me the goals he would like to reach with me. I agreed I needed to obtain every step he outlined. I like him and am comfortable with him. I agree to meet on a weekly basis. An investigator is scheduled to come to my office from the State Medical Board Examiner's Office Wednesday morning. This follows a complaint filed by attorney against AP. I will be required to give a sworn deposition concerning the affair. I resent every step I have to take as a result of her affair. I don't believe she is faking a mental breakdown, however, I am finding it very difficult to be sympathetic. I think I have caught you up. I, 24M, have been dating my girlfriend Sarah, 23F, for about a year and a half now. Things were great at first but lately, she has been getting more and more possessive and jealous. It started small, like her getting upset if I liked another girl's Instagram pics or something else. Thought I would just reassure her that she was the only one for me, but then it started getting worse. Anytime I would mention a female co-worker or a friend, she would get suspicious and accuse me of cheating or wanting to cheat. I told her several times that she had nothing to worry about, but the accusations kept coming. The final straw was a couple of weeks ago. I'm an accountant and was working on a big project with a co-worker named Lisa. So we were working late at night for several days in a row trying to get this thing done. Since we were working so closely together and for long hours, we decided to start taking lunch breaks together to give our brains a break from the project. The first day Lisa and I went to lunch. It was nice to just talk about non-work stuff for an hour. When I got home that night, I told Sarah about my day, including going to lunch with Lisa. She immediately got angry, accusing me of cheating on her and claiming this was inappropriate. I tried to reassure her again that Lisa was just a co-worker and nothing more, but Sarah wouldn't let it go. She said I was forbidden from having lunch with Lisa again. I told her she was being ridiculous and unfair by trying to control who I could or couldn't eat lunch with. She refused to take her words back insisting that it was disrespectful for me to get lunch with another woman. The next day I went to lunch with Lisa again. I didn't think I should have to get Sarah's permission on who I share a meal with at work. When I got home, Sarah screamed about how I betrayed and disrespected her. I yelled back that she was acting like a crazy, controlling girlfriend. So this turned into a huge fight that ended with Sarah demanding I stop seeing Lisa outside of work hours 
and me refusing to accept her trying to control my life. Over the next week, the tension kept growing and any little thing would set Sarah off. She was constantly questioning me about Lisa and other women from work. So one night she even drove over to my office after hours to make sure my car was still there and that I wasn't out to dinner with Lisa. I told her this obsessive, paranoid behavior had to stop or we were through. Sarah promised to try to work on her jealousy issues, but a few days later she was right back at it with the accusations and screaming at me about Lisa. So I finally decided I had had enough. I told Sarah I was breaking up with her due to her complete lack of trust in me and repeated disrespectful demands about who I could interact with. She cried and promised she would change, but I said it was too late. I was done. I moved out immediately and had been staying at a buddy's place. But now a few of Sarah's friends and even some in my family are saying yada for how I handled this. They think I should have been more understanding about Sarah's jealousy issues and tried harder to make it work before immediately ending a one-and-a-half-year-old relationship. I will admit the breakup was kind of sudden instead of talking it out more, but I don't think I should have to justify having a work lunch with a co-worker or put up with Sarah's crazy accusations anymore. Ida here for being too harsh and not giving her another chance. Update 1. Wow, I did not expect my last post to blow up like that. Thanks to everyone who commented and gave their judgment on the situation. After reading through the comments and getting an outside perspective, I realize I probably could have handled the actual breakup better instead of just abruptly ending things in the heat of an argument. However, I stand by my decision that Sarah's controlling behavior and jealousy issues had reached a point where I no longer wanted to be in the relationship. Anyway, it's been about six weeks now since Sarah and I broke up. I am still staying with my buddy while I look for a new apartment. Sarah texted me a couple of times in the first week asking to talk but I ignored her messages. I just didn't see any point in it, but something happened yesterday that I can't stop thinking about. So one of Sarah's close friends, Jen, contacted me and said she needed to discuss something important with me in person. I agreed to meet up with Jen at a coffee shop after I got off work. When we sat down, Jen was acting all nervous and hesitant. Finally, she took a deep breath and told me that the real reason Sarah was acting so jealous recently was because she was the one who was actually cheating on me. Jen said that Sarah had reconnected with an ex-boyfriend, Tyler, on social media a couple of months ago. The two of them started talking more and more, and eventually met up and hooked up several times over the last six to eight weeks. So I was absolutely stunned. I never would have imagined Sarah was capable of cheating. Jen said Sarah confessed everything to her the day after we broke up. Sarah claimed she still loved me but got caught up in the excitement of rekindling things with her hot ex. The worst part is that Tyler is the guy Sarah dated right before me. They were together for over a year and Sarah has always described him as her first real love. She never fully got over their breakup which happened because Tyler had to move away for grad school. I feel sick thinking about Sarah sleeping with Tyler behind my back all while she was accusing me of cheating with Lisa. No wonder she was so quick to condemn me for having lunch with female co-worker when she was busy with her ex. Of course it all makes sense now. The increased jealousy and possessiveness was Sarah projecting her own guilt. So but she manipulated me into thinking I had done something wrong and rather than confessing she restarted something with her ex. I can't believe Sarah made me feel so terrible when she was betraying me the whole time. So if only I had known the truth right away, I could have dumped her instantly rather than trying to reassure her first. I feel like such an idiot for not realizing something was up these past couple of months. Jen apologized for not telling me sooner but said she wanted to remain loyal to her friend at first. She felt I deserved to know the truth though, especially with Sarah trying to get me back. Jen agreed Sarah's behavior was really unfair, and I had every right to break things off. So this revelation leaves me wondering if I should reach out to Sarah after all, if only to get the full story and closure. Part of me wants to take the high road and not lower to her level. But I also feel used and disrespected and want to tell Sarah exactly what I think of her cheating. My buddy thinks I should text Sarah something like, Jen told me everything. I can't believe you cheated while falsely accusing me of cheating. You're not the person I thought you were and this proves I made the right call to dump you. Don't ever contact me again. That would certainly feel justified, but I don't know if it's the healthiest approach for me moving forward. I would certainly be taking the bait by engaging with Sarah again after ignoring her past messages. Maybe the best revenge is just living well and not allowing Sarah any more space in my head or life. What do you all think? Should I reach out to Sarah and get any lingering thoughts off my chest? Or take the high road and not give her the satisfaction of a response?
This revelation changes the context of our breakup significantly. So let me know your advice. Update to hello again, everyone. It's been a couple of months since my last update. I moved into my own place and settled into a routine, and life has been pretty calm and uneventful. Until I heard from Sarah out of the blue this week, I was absolutely shocked when she called me Tuesday night crying and begging for my help. Through her sobs, Sarah explained that Tyler had stolen money from her and then disappeared. Apparently, right after Sarah and I broke up, Tyler convinced her that they should move in together right away. Sarah agreed and they got an apartment the following month. According to Sarah, at first, things were amazing between them just like in old times. So slowly, Tyler started taking advantage of her. He would forget his wallet and have her pay for everything. At the time, Sarah didn't think much of it and wanted to be generous since Tyler was her romantic partner. However, Tyler's financial requests kept getting bigger and bigger. He asked Sarah to pay his half of the rent and utilities for several months in a row because he had lost his job. So then Tyler started asking to borrow large chunks of cash for car repairs, medical bills, and other emergencies. Sarah gave him thousands of dollars over the last couple of months. She drained most of her savings trying to help Tyler out. Sarah admitted she felt hesitant at times, but Tyler always promised to pay her back. He would swear the money was for something important or say he just needed to get through this rough patch. Sarah still felt residual guilt about how things ended between us, so she wanted to do everything she could to make it work with Tyler. Of course, Tyler never paid her back a cent. Everything finally culminated when Sarah got her credit card statement this week. There were two cash advances taken out totaling $5,000 that she did not initiate. When she confronted Tyler, he denied any knowledge and claimed someone must have stolen the card. Sarah was suspicious about the timing and large amounts, so she pressed Tyler harder for the truth. Finally, he broke down and confessed to taking the cash advances from her credit card without permission. Even worse, the money wasn't for an emergency but rather Tyler's gambling debt. He'd apparently gotten heavily into sports betting and owed some dangerous people. Sarah was outraged and immediately kicked Tyler out. But the next day she found that Tyler had cleaned out their joint checking account, nearly $2,000 more gone. He clearly proactively drained the account knowing Sarah would end to make matters worse. Right after clearing out the money, Tyler blocked Sarah on all platforms and disappeared. So none of their mutual friends have heard from him or know where he is either. Sarah is terrified Tyler stole thousands more from her and is now on the run to avoid repaying. And so that's why Sarah was calling me desperate for advice or help dealing with the police and trying to get her money back. So I'll admit that I wanted to hang up on her or say that she deserved it. But I stayed on the phone and tried to give Sarah some practical tips to come out of this. I told her to contact her banks and report the unauthorized cash advances so they don't continue growing interest. I said she should also alert the police about the theft and see if they have any options for tracking Tyler down. So beyond that, I recommended Sarah look into ways to lock down her credit and account so Tyler can't continue taking advantage. So by the end of the call, Sarah was very grateful for my willingness to help after how terribly she treated me. So I reiterated that I have no interest in getting back together. But she's clearly in a scary situation so I couldn't bring myself to completely abandon her either. Sarah apologized again for everything between us and swore she never expected Tyler to pull something like this. I have mixed feelings now about Sarah reaching out to me. I am relieved I could provide some practical guidance for dealing with the aftermath of Tyler's betrayal. It confirms I am making healthier choices, but part of me worries I'm enabling Sarah's poor decisions by offering support. My buddy thinks I should continue limiting contact and let Sarah figure this out on her own. He says I've already spent too much time and energy on her drama, but other friends say I did the right thing helping Sarah in a crisis, and that I shouldn't let bitterness prevent me from being kind. What do you all think? Was I a sucker for becoming Sarah's shoulder to cry on? Should I further limit contact again, or maintain respect if she needs additional help? I thought I had moved on but this pulled out all sorts of old feelings and self-doubt. Any insight is appreciated. Now on to the next story. Story 2. Leaving three-year-old daughter behind because I failed in life and just got the news that I'm dying. As the title says, last week I got the news that I am dying from lung cancer from my doctor. Turns out smoking since I was 15 and then upping it to three packs each day a few years ago was a bad idea. Stupid I know, I thought it wouldn't come so soon though. It's stage four and as of now I have months to live. Please don't feel bad for me, I've done nothing good in life except have my daughter to really be sad about losing me. 
I have no family because I grew up in the foster system and aged out at 18. So my daughter's father is in prison for serious crimes that even if he got out he wouldn't be allowed to be in her life. My daughter is only three. We don't live in a good area, and when I go to work I have to leave her with an elderly neighbor that always gets her name wrong every day. I don't want her to grow up like I did, in that foster care system. I feel like it's the reason why I messed up and did nothing good with my life. Yeah, I know it's not the only reason and my own stupidity caused most of my issues, but if I just had some family or a support system to keep me in check it could have been better. I just want to give her some chance to have a better shot than I did. The thing is I do have an idea for who could take care of her. One of my closest friends is a co-worker at my job, and she's amazing. While I'm at the bottom of the job, like if they need to lay off people I would definitely be the first to go, she's their prized worker and makes serious bank. She has a good husband and a kid. I want to ask her if she would be okay with adopting my little girl once I'm gone. But I know it won't go well. The thing is, my co-worker and her family are black, and me and my daughter are white. Like we both have blue eyes and can't tan white. There is no way I can ask my friend to adopt my daughter, and force her to deal with those kind of issues in adoption like that will bring to her family. But then that just leaves my little girl to grow up like I did in a shitty system with only a will of about a thousand dollars to help her, and a necklace my mother had that I'm going to give her. I don't know if I should bite the bullet and ask my close friend if she is willing to take my daughter, or just suck it up and try to work as hard as I can to get as much money into my will for my girl. But either way, I failed as a mother. And that is a regret I am literally taking to my grave. Edit, okay, I reached out to her, and we were able to set up a place to meet, it's some simple cheap bakery you can eat inside. I'm going to ask her if she can adopt my daughter. That way if she says no I can have more time to go to an adoption agency near us. Thank you for the support everyone. Update 1. Alright I'm back now. A day after my post I was able to meet up with my friend slash co-worker. And after telling her about my diagnosis, which is something I haven't told anyone at work, I asked her if she was willing to adopt my little girl. She was shocked and tried to comfort me about my upcoming death, but she told me she couldn't give me her answer right then and there. Turns out, she does want a daughter, but something happened in her second pregnancy and caused her issues I don't feel right sharing. So she does want to consider adopting, but she first needed to talk to her husband and talk about planning if he agrees. I understood since it was a big change in their family. I said okay and after we ate she gave me a hug and told me she will miss me. This is embarrassing but I actually started crying. I also started making the emails, you slash Bundis playbook gave me this idea and I thought it was amazing. So I created an email for my daughter and started pre-recording videos for stuff. It's nowhere near ready, but I already have some ideas and recorded some videos for her birthdays and some big life events like first crushes and prom and first job. Sad to say, but I realized planning it that most of the videos will be don't do what I did. My friend reached out to me a few days ago and said that after having a long talk with her they both are considering it. Apparently they do this thing where after talking about a huge change in their lives they'll come to something to agree on, and then wait for a while and if they're still on the same page, then it sounds like a good idea. She did tell me that it wasn't a yes though, there are some issues they want to fix first. She said that while they both really like the idea they barely know anything about my little girl. Her husband and six-year-old son haven't even seen her, and while she has seen and heard about her, it's for me. So she told me about a plan they came up with. For the rest of this month I'm going to have to get up two hours earlier than normal to drop off my daughter at their house so her husband can watch over her as he works at home. Then I'll go to work with my co-worker. This way her husband and son can get to know her. She also said she wants us to celebrate Christmas with them, so that's something to look forward to in the future. And I've already done it yesterday, and when I went to go pick up my little girl she was the happiest I've ever seen her in a long time. So my friend's husband said that they went off on the wrong foot in the start. He said she was really scared sometimes and didn't want to play with their son yet, but since it was their first day he thinks she'll get better. So we did it again today, and he said she mostly watched their son play, but it was already better than yesterday. So that's what's happening right now. I'm scared this will be for nothing, but at the very least now my daughter is getting better at their house for now. So even if they say no in the end, she already has some better memories than when she was with me. Comments where OP has replied. Lou underscore Ava, sending you so much love, sweetheart. I hope you're able to enjoy your little girl and find peace knowing she'll be with a loving family 
And even if it ends up not working out, you did and are doing your best to provide her the best possible future. Just a recommendation with the email, get a backup or backups for the videos. Be it a CD, USB, online backup or others. I have an email used to receive only, and it goes directly to my mail app on iPhone, so I don't directly log into the account on Gmail. Well, I got an email some time ago that since there's been no activity on the email for a few years, that the account would be closed in a few months. So I just sent myself a few emails, but it may happen. So please get a backup, because she'll definitely appreciate it. T, thank you. I'll try to do backups in any videos. I think if my friend says yes after all of this, I'll tell her about email deletion so she could help stop that from happening. That does scare me is doing all of the emails and having them lost before she can see them. Dark recess, I know I'm only a n internet stranger, but as a mom, I'm proud of you. You don't have much but everything you do have is focused on your baby girl, and that's what makes a great mom. One thing I will say to add to the email idea, if you can, grab some loose sheets of paper or a small notebook and write down your favorite recipes, including all the things you add that make it something only you've made. Give that to her because one day she'll be happy to say, I made my mom's food. Write down little happy things you come across in the time you have left, not in email form but in your own handwriting, because she'll treasure that in years to come, and it's a tangible link to you. Write down places you like to go, favorite color, favorite music, things like that. So little pieces of you so she'll have something to physically hold on to when times get hard. You have all my love. OP, I was thinking of writing a letter for my little girl's 13th birthday. The only thing I have from my mom is this necklace that has been with me. I don't know what it is, but it has a lot of curls and hoops with a pretty almost clear stone in the middle. I was going to write a letter explaining the necklace is from her grandmother and now since she would be old enough it's going to be hers. I do have recipes I know she loves, that would be an amazing idea. She loves my egg salad sandwiches, so that's one recipe I'll write down. Thank you for the idea. Update 2, my friend gave me her family's decision, and I also lost my job. January 20th, 2024. I'm back again. I'm sorry for being gone so long a lot has happened and this will be my last post. So this is going to be long sorry. First, I started feeling real sick days after Christmas. My whole chest was hurting like someone was hitting it with a hammer over and over, and I was coughing up blood. My best friend was terrified that I cut something, because the doctors have said that me getting sick right now could be deadly, so we had to go to the doctor. Thankfully I didn't get anything, it was the symptoms getting worse. Also, thankfully at the time I was still at work, so I didn't have to pay much for the bills. Yeah, that was another terrible thing that happened to me recently. After that trip to the hospital my work called me in privately. Remember how I said that if something were to happen, I would be the first to go. Guess what? The bosses were telling me how they couldn't keep me there as I'm dying, because it wouldn't feel right, and how it's apparent to them my illness was slowing me down and forcing my co-workers to work harder to make up for me, wouldn't be fair and all that. I know I was just causing more problems to my co-workers since I got diagnosed, but I didn't think they would complain about me to my bosses. I'm so stupid for that, of course I was being a pain. I was hoping to still be with them to the end of the month so I could pay my apartment rent. And I had barely enough money for bills, rent, groceries, public transport, and hospital bills. So this is where my best friend slash former co-worker comes in. After testing out caring for my little girl for a few weeks and spending a big holiday with them, she and her husband agreed to adopt her. She was telling me about some of her plans and I told her it would probably be for the best that my daughter moves in with them. She asked me why and I told her our work fired me and I wouldn't be able to care for both of us with so little money. She told me we both could move in with them, they have plenty of guest rooms I could pick. Swear I tried to say no, her family was already doing so much for us I felt like this was too much. She told me I could be a huge help for them living there during my last months. Her husband could use the help looking after her as he works. I can help them decorate and fix up her new room, show them the foods my daughter likes to eat. So I promise I'm not going to be a bother to them, and we are hard at work getting the needed papers to get her for the adoption after I'm gone. Suffides, me living there could help my little girl become more comfortable in her new home. And guess how rich her family are. They have a personal family lawyer. When I haven't been feeling sick, we've been working with him to make sure the adoption goes through. Okay, after all of that I do want to share some other fun news. Christmas with them was probably the best Christmas my daughter and even I've ever had our entire lives. 
My friend's family had like five Christmas trees in their entire house. Thanks to my friend, I was able to make a really special Christmas gift for my daughter, a build a bear. So, well, it was really a bunny, but still. So I made a voice recording telling her how much I love and will always try to keep her safe. And my friend knows about the emails. I'm almost done with them, actually. Just a few more left. I gave her the password to both the email and this Reddit account so once I pass, she could delete this one. Sorry, but I've been so much messages I don't want people to message me when I'm gone. And about the messages, I've gotten a lot since I updated. Apparently my story was shared on TikTok. That's cool. It's weird I've gotten so many people reaching out to me and messaging me wanting to talk. I've never had that happen in my life. It's funny how it happens once I'm dying. Con saying how if my friend said no, they would love to adopt my little girl. Thank you. But thankfully my friend did say yes. But if you still want to adopt, please reach out to a foster care system in your state. There are still children struggling in the system going through what I did. Give those kids the life I could never have. I've also had some saying how they would love to pay me money to help. Please don't bother. Sorry, but it feels weird accepting money. My whole life I've worked for everything I've had so it feels wrong accepting money and help from strangers just because I'm dying. I do want to address a few messages I've gotten about race. Most were about why I cared about my friend's family and me and my daughter's race being different. It wasn't a lot, but a few called me a racist for caring about that. I want to say that my nerves about that isn't, because I think me and my daughter being white makes us better than my friend. Far from it. I've seen a lot of stuff in the system and talked with other kids of different races. And those kids of different races were put into care with people who were also a different race from them. They would tell me the problems they faced from the parents, not that I'm scared my friend will do that, but also from the outside world. Dean called names and insulted. One kid told me how she got screamed at by some older lady at a restaurant, and the parents did try to get involved, and it got into a nasty fight. So yeah, I was scared her family and my daughter would face the same bigotry the kids I knew from before faced. So but I can't let my fears about some bigots ruin my daughter's chances. Anyways, this will be the last time I'm going to probably post on here. I don't want to waste my last days. I've thought about taking up painting again, actually. I used to paint when I was in high school before I was dropped out, and once in the same school we've read a classic book about a world where books are banned. I don't remember a lot from the story, but I do remember at the ending, when a character said you didn't waste life when you make something to leave behind. That always stuck with me. I want to paint something. Maybe my friend could hang it up or keep it in their attic, but as long as I've left something behind my life wasn't for nothing right. I also need to help my friend's family and my daughter settle into their new lives. Thank you to everyone for your kindness. And goodbye. Additional information from OP on her other family members not taking her daughter. Her father is in prison for a hopeful very long time, because he did a crime involving children so even if he got out he would not be allowed around her. So not like I would want him to. My parents are dead. I'm Richard, 30M, and I've been married to my wife Sammy, 28F, for five years. We have a three-year-old daughter named Emma. Sammy and I met in college where we were both studying business. We hit it off immediately and started dating in our sophomore year. After graduation, we both got jobs at the same marketing firm, which is where we still work today. Sammy has a younger sister, Jessica, 25F, who has always been the troublemaker in the family. Growing up, Jessica was always getting into fights at school, sneaking out at night, and generally causing their parents a lot of stress. When Jessica was 16, she got caught shoplifting and had to do community service. This incident seemed to be a wake-up call for her, and she straightened out for a while. Jessica managed to graduate high school and even started college, which made her parents really proud. But halfway through her freshman year, she dropped out, saying college wasn't for her. Since then, she's been bouncing from job to job, never staying in one place for more than a few months. Sammy and Jessica's parents, Tom and Linda, have always been very supportive of both their daughters. They paid for both girls to go to college and have often helped Jessica out financially when she's been between jobs. Tom and Linda are kind people, but I sometimes think they enable Jessica's behavior by always bailing her out. A few weeks ago, Jessica lost her job at a restaurant where she'd been working for only months. She got into an argument with a customer who complained about their food being cold. Instead of handling it professionally, Jessica apparently told the customer to microwave it yourself and stormed off. The manager fired her on the spot. The day after she was fired, Jessica called Sammy crying and asking if she could move in with us just for a few weeks until she found a new job. Sammy, being the kind-hearted person she is, 
immediately said yes without even consulting me. When she told me about it later that evening, I was not happy. I reminded Sammy about all the times Jessica had taken advantage of her kindness in the past. So there was the time she borrowed $2,000 from us for a car down payment, which she never paid back. She promised to pay us back $100 every month, but after the first two payments, she stopped, always having some excuse about why she couldn't pay that month. Then there was the time she stayed with us for a month when she first moved to our city. She said she'd help with chores and cooking, but she never lifted a finger. She'd sleep until noon every day, eat our food, and leave dirty dishes all over the house. When she finally moved out, we had to deep clean the guest room because it smelled like stale cigarettes, even though we'd asked her not to smoke in the house. So not to mention the countless times she's shown up unannounced at our doorstep, expecting to be fed and entertained. She'd often bring friends over without asking, raid our fridge, and leave without so much as a thank you. I told Sammy that I didn't want Jessica living with us, especially with our young daughter in the house. Jessica has a habit of staying out late, drinking excessively and bringing random guys home. I didn't want that kind of influence around Emma. Emma is at an age where she's very impressionable, and I worry about the example Jessica might set. Sammy argued that Jessica was family and that we should help her out. She said it would only be for a few weeks and that Jessica had promised to be on her best behavior. Asas, she reminded me of how her parents had always been there for us, like when they helped us with the down payment on our house, or when Linda stayed with us for two weeks after Emma was born to help out. I wasn't convinced. I knew from past experience that Jessica's few weeks could easily turn into months, and her promises were often broken. I also pointed out that there's a big difference between her parents helping us out and us constantly bailing out Jessica. We've worked hard for what we have. And I don't think it's fair for Jessica to take advantage of that. We argued about it for hours. Sammy accused me of being heartless and said that I didn't understand what it meant to be family. Makey, she brought up how my own sister had stayed with us for a month when she was going through her divorce and how I hadn't hesitated to help her out. So I explained that the situation with my sister was different. She had a job, contributed to household expenses, and had a clear plan for getting back on her feet. Jessica, on the other hand, had a history of taking advantage of people's kindness without any real effort to improve her situation. In the end, I put my foot down and said that Jessica could not move in with us. I suggested that we could help her find a cheap apartment or even pay for a month's rent somewhere, but our house was off limits. I explained that I was willing to help Jessica, but not in a way that might disrupt our family life or potentially expose Emma to negative influences. Sammy was furious with me and hasn't spoken to me properly in days. She's been giving me the cold shoulder only talking to me when it's absolutely necessary, usually about Emma or household chores. I can tell she's really upset, but I still believe I made the right decision for our family. Jessica found out about my decision and has been bad-mouthing me to the rest of the family. She's been telling everyone that I'm cruel and that I've never liked her. This isn't true, I've always tried to be polite and welcoming to Jessica, even when her behavior was difficult to deal with. My in-laws have been calling and texting, telling me how disappointed they are in me for not helping out family in need. Tom even called me and tried to guilt trip me, saying that they had always treated me like a son and couldn't believe I would turn my back on family like this. Even my own parents think I'm being too harsh. My mom called and reminded me of all the times my family had helped me out when I was younger. She said that family should always come first and that I should reconsider my decision. The whole situation has created a lot of tension in our extended family. Sammy's cousins, who I usually get along with well, have been cold to me at recent family gatherings. I overheard one of them saying that I was being controlling and that Sammy should stand up to me. But I stand by my decision. I believe that sometimes tough love is necessary and that constantly bailing Jessica out isn't doing her any favors in the long run. She needs to learn to stand on her own two feet and face the consequences of her actions. I think that by always rescuing her, her family has prevented her from growing up and taking responsibility for her life. I've tried to explain my reasoning to Sammy, but she's too upset to listen. I suggested that we could offer to help Jessica in other ways, like helping her update her resume or practicing job interview skills with her. But Sammy says that's not enough and that Jessica needs a stable place to live while she gets back on her feet. The whole situation has put a strain on our marriage. Sammy and I have always been a team, making decisions together and supporting each other. This is the first time we've had such a major disagreement and I'm not sure how to fix it. I love Sammy and hate seeing her upset but I also feel strongly that I'm doing the right thing for our family. I'm starting to doubt myself, though. Am I the asshole for refusing to let my sister-in-law move in with us? Should I have given in to keep the peace in the family?
Or am I right to stand my ground and protect my own family's well-being? I'm torn between my love for my wife and my desire to do what I think is best for our daughter and our home life. Update 1. It's been two weeks since my last post, and a lot has happened. I wanted to give you all an update on the situation with Jessica. So a few days after I refused to let Jessica move in, Sammy's parents offered to let her stay with them. They have a spare room in their house, and they thought it would be a good opportunity for Jessica to get back on her feet. Sammy was relieved, thinking this would solve the problem. I was hopeful too, thinking that maybe with her parents' supervision, Jessica might finally start to turn her life around. However, things took an unexpected turn. Jessica moved in with her parents, but after just three days, she got into a huge fight with them. Apparently, they had set some ground rules about job searching and helping around the house, which Jessica didn't take well. She accused them of treating her like a child and said she couldn't live under their dictatorship. She stormed out of their house in the middle of the night, leaving behind most of her belongings. The next morning, we got a frantic call from Sammy's mom. Linda, Jessica had disappeared, and they couldn't reach her on her phone. They had already called all of Jessica's friends that they knew of, but no one had seen her. Linda was in tears worried that something bad might have happened to Jessica. Sammy was worried sick and spent the whole day trying to contact Jessica or any of her friends who might know where she was. She even called Jessica's ex-boyfriends, thinking she might have gone to one of them for help, but no one had seen or heard from her. As the day went on, Sammy became more and more distraught. She started blaming herself, saying that if we had just let Jessica stay with us, none of this would have happened. I tried to comfort her, reminding her that Jessica was an adult who made her own choices, but Sammy was too upset to listen. Late that night, we finally got a call from Jessica. She was drunk and crying, saying she was at some guy's apartment and didn't know how to get home. She couldn't remember the guy's name or the exact address of where she was. Sammy immediately wanted to go pick her up, but I was hesitant. I didn't want Sammy driving across town in the middle of the night to an unknown location. After some discussion, we compromised. I would go pick up Jessica, but Sammy would stay home with Emma. Um... I got what information I could from Jessica about her location and drove there, feeling a mix of anger and concern. It took me almost an hour to find the right apartment building. When I finally found the right place and knocked on the door, a guy I'd never seen before answered. He looked relieved to see me and explained that Jessica had shown up at the bar where he worked, got extremely drunk, and he had brought her back to his place because she couldn't remember where she lived. He said he had tried to get her to call someone earlier, but she had refused. I found Jessica passed out on the guy's couch. I thanked him for looking out for her and apologized for the trouble. As I was helping Jessica to my car, she woke up and started rambling about how everyone in her life was against her and how she was sick of people trying to control her. I mostly stayed quiet, not wanting to argue with her in her current state. When we got home, Sammy helped Jessica into the guest room to sleep it off. Sammy wanted to stay up and talk to Jessica but I convinced her to wait until morning when Jessica would be sober. The next morning, Jessica was incredibly hungover and embarrassed. She could barely remember what had happened the night before. When Sammy and I sat down to talk with her, she broke down crying, admitting that had a problem and needed help. Sammy and I had a long talk with Jessica. We told her that we were willing to help her, but on our terms. But we laid out a plan. Jessica could stay with us for one month, but during that time she had to attend AA meetings, see a therapist, and actively look for a job, so we made it clear that this was her last chance, and if she didn't stick to the plan, she would have to leave. To our surprise, Jessica agreed to everything. She seemed genuinely remorseful and determined to change. She said she was tired of disappointing everyone and wanted to get her life together. Sammy was overjoyed, thinking this was the turning point Jessica needed. I, however, remained skeptical, so I've seen Jessica make promises before, only to break them when things got tough. I agreed to give her this chance, but I made it clear to Sammy that I wouldn't hesitate to ask Jessica to leave if she violated our agreement. We set up some ground rules for Jessica's stay. She had to be home by 10 p.m. every night, wasn't allowed to bring anyone to the house without our permission, and had to contribute to household chores. We also made it that any drinking or drug use would result in immediate eviction. It's been a week since Jessica moved in, and so far, things have been okay. She's been attending AA meetings and has an appointment with a therapist next week. She's also applied for a few jobs online. She's been helping around the house, doing dishes and laundry without being asked. But I can't shake this feeling of unease. I catch Jessica giving me dirty looks when she thinks I'm not looking. And I've overheard her complaining to Sammy about how strict our rules are. Yesterday, I noticed that some cash was missing from my wallet. It wasn't a lot, just $20 
but it made me suspicious. I'm also worried about the effect this is having on Emma. She seems confused by Jessica's presence and has been acting out more than usual. She had a tantrum at daycare yesterday, which is very unlike her. Sammy, on the other hand, is thrilled. She's convinced that Jessica has turned over a new leaf and keeps talking about how proud she is of her sister. She's been spending a lot of time with Jessica, helping her look for jobs and talking about her future plans. I'm trying to be supportive, but I'm finding it hard. Every time I see Jessica, I'm reminded of all the times she's let us down in the past. I'm worried that she'll slip up and hurt Sammy again, or worse, that she'll be a bad influence on Emma. I'm also concerned about the strain this is putting on my relationship with Sammy. We've been arguing more than usual, often about Jessica. Sammy thinks I'm not being supportive enough, while I feel like she's being too lenient. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that this really is the wake-up call Jessica needed, but a part of me is preparing for the worst. I'm determined to protect my family, even if it means being the bad guy in everyone else's eyes. Am I being too paranoid? Should I give Jessica the benefit of the doubt? Or am I right to be cautious given her past behavior? I'm struggling to find the right balance between being supportive and protecting my family. Update 2 It's been a month since Jessica moved in with us, and I have some surprising news to share. For the first three weeks, Jessica seemed to be sticking to our agreement. She attended her AM meetings regularly, saw her therapist twice a week, and even landed a job at a local bookstore. She was home every night by 10 p.m., helped with household chores, and was generally pleasant to be around. Sammy was thrilled, constantly telling me how proud she was of Jessica's progress. I had to admit, I was impressed too, although I remained cautiously optimistic. Jessica and Emma seemed to be bonding, which made Sammy happy. Jessica would read bedtime stories to Emma and even took her to the park a few times. A city, I was still a bit wary, but I couldn't deny that it was nice to see them getting along. However, things took an unexpected turn last week. I came home early from work one day, not feeling well. As I walked into the house, I heard voices coming from the living room. I recognized Jessica's voice, but the other voice was male and unfamiliar. I walked into the living room to find Jessica sitting on the couch with a man I'd never seen before. They both looked surprised to see me. Jessica quickly introduced the man as Mike, saying he was a friend from her ah ab meetings. I noticed two beer bottles on the coffee table in front of them. I was furious. Not only had Jessica broken our no alcohol rule, but she had also brought a stranger into our home without permission, where our daughter could have easily walked in and seen them. I told Mike he needed to leave immediately, which he did, looking embarrassed. Once Mike was gone, I confronted Jessica. She tried to downplay the situation, saying it was just one beer and that Mike was a good guy. I reminded her of our agreement and told her that this was unacceptable. I said she needed to pack her things and leave. Jessica burst into tears and begged me not to tell Sammy. She swore it was a one-time slip-up and that she'd been doing so well otherwise. She said she couldn't bear to disappoint Sammy again. I was torn. On one hand, I knew how much it would hurt Sammy to see Jessica fail again. On the other hand, I had promised myself I wouldn't let Jessica take advantage of us anymore. After some thought, I made a decision. I told Jessica that I wouldn't tell Sammy about the beer incident on one condition. She had to move out by the end of the week. I explained that while I appreciated her progress, I couldn't trust her in our home anymore. Jessica reluctantly agreed. The next few days were tense. Jessica started packing her things discreetly while I tried to act normal around Sammy. I felt guilty for keeping this from my wife, but I truly believed it was for the best. Sammy was so happy thinking Jessica had turned her life around, and I didn't want to be the one to shatter that illusion. On the day Jessica was supposed to leave, another shocking revelation came to light. Sammy came to me, visibly upset, holding Jessica's phone. Apparently Jessica had left it unlocked on the kitchen counter, and Sammy had seen a text message pop up that caught her attention. The message was from Mike, the guy I had caught Jessica with. It said something about getting their story straight before Jessica left our house. Confused and worried, Sammy had looked through more of the messages I know invasion of privacy, but given the circumstances I don't blame her. What she found was horrifying. Jessica had been planning this whole charade from the beginning. The night she got drunk and needed me to pick her up? It was all an act. She had coordinated with Mike to make it look like she had hit rock bottom so that we would feel obligated to take her in. The messages revealed that Jessica never actually attended any AA meetings or therapy sessions. She had been using that time to meet up with Mike and plan their next move. The job at the bookstore was real, but Jessica had been stealing money from the register to fund her and Mike's drug habit. Sammy was devastated. 
She confronted Jessica, who initially tried to deny everything but eventually broke down and admitted to it all. She said she needed a place to stay and access to drug habit, and she knew we wouldn't help her if we knew the truth. I was angry beyond words, not just at Jessica for her betrayal, but at myself for not trusting my initial instincts. I told Jessica to get out of our house immediately, and this time, Sammy didn't argue. As Jessica left, Sammy turned to me and apologized for not believing me from the start. She admitted that she had always wanted to see the best in her sister, but now she realized that Jessica needed more help than we could provide. We've decided to cut off all contact with Jessica for now. Sammy is heartbroken but understands that it's necessary for our family's well-being. We've informed the rest of the family about what happened, and while they're shocked and saddened, they support our decision. This whole experience has been a harsh wake-up call for all of us. It's shown us the importance of trusting our instincts and setting firm boundaries, even with family. While I wish things had turned out differently, I'm relieved that the truth came out before Jessica could do any more damage to our family. We're now focusing on healing as a family. Sammy and I are looking into family therapy to help us process this experience and strengthen our relationship. We're also spending extra time with Emma, making sure she feels secure and loved. I'm still struggling with guilt over not telling Sammy about the beer incident right away, but I'm trying to forgive myself. I know I was trying to protect her, even if it wasn't the right way to go about it. As for Jessica, we hope she gets the help she needs, but we can't be the ones to provide it. We've learned the hard way that sometimes loving someone means letting them face the consequences of their actions. Update 3. It's been six months since the incident with Jessica, and I wanted to give you all a final update on our situation. After Jessica left our house, we didn't hear from her for several weeks. Sammy was devastated and went through a period of depression, blaming herself for not seeing through Jessica's lies. I did my best to support her, reminding her that Jessica's actions were not her fault. We started seeing a family therapist, which has been incredibly helpful in processing everything that happened. About a month after Jessica left, we received a call from the local police department. Jessica had been arrested for possession of drugs and theft. Apparently, her scam at the bookstore had been discovered, and when the police searched her apartment, they found a significant amount of illegal substances. Sammy was torn about whether to bail Jessica out or not. After much discussion, we decided not to. So we felt that Jessica needed to face the consequences of her actions if she was ever going to change. So it was a difficult decision, especially for Sammy, but we both agreed it was necessary. To our surprise, this seemed to be the wake-up call Jessica needed. While in jail, she enrolled in a court-mandated rehab program. She wrote us a letter taking full responsibility for her actions and apologizing for the pain she had caused. She didn't ask for anything, just said she wanted us to know she was trying to get better. Sammy and I discussed it and decided to respond with a short, supportive message. We told Jessica we were glad she was getting help, but that we needed time and space to heal from what had happened. We made it clear that while we hoped for her recovery, we weren't ready to have her back in our lives. Over the next few months, we received updates from Jessica's counselor, with Jessica's permission. She was making progress in her rehab program and seemed committed to turning her life around. She had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was finally getting proper treatment for it, which explained some of her erratic behavior in the past. Three months ago, Jessica was released from jail and entered a halfway house. She's been attending NA meetings regularly and has even started taking classes at a community college. She reached out to us again asking if we would be willing to meet with her and her counselor. After much consideration, Sammy and I agreed to a meeting. It was difficult and emotional, but also productive. Jessica took full responsibility for her actions, without making excuses. She understood why we had cut contact and respected our boundaries. She didn't ask to be part of our lives again, just wanted to make amends. We're taking things very slowly. We've had a few more meetings with Jessica and her counselor, always in a controlled environment. She's been clean for six months now and seems to be making genuine progress. She's holding down a part-time job and continuing her studies. Sammy and I have been continuing our family therapy sessions. It's helped us communicate better and strengthen our relationship. We've learned a lot about setting healthy boundaries and supporting each other through difficult times. As for our relationship with Jessica, we're cautiously optimistic. We're not ready to fully trust her again and she understands that. For now, we're maintaining limited contact. She's not allowed in our home or around Emma unsupervised, but we do occasionally meet for coffee or talk on the phone. Emma, who's now almost four, doesn't really remember much about what happened. We've explained in simple terms that Aunt Jessica was sick and needed to get better, and that's why she hasn't been around. We're being careful about reintroducing Jessica into Emma's life, always putting our daughter's well-being first. Our relationships with the rest of the family have mostly healed, 
Sammy's parents have apologized for enabling Jessica's behavior in the past and have been supportive of our decisions. They're also maintaining boundaries with Jessica, which has been good for everyone. This whole experience has taught us a lot about setting boundaries, the importance of trust in relationships, and the complex nature of addiction and mental health issues. While the road ahead is still long and uncertain, we're hopeful that Jessica will continue on her path to recovery. We're focusing on our own family and healing, taking it one day at a time. We've learned not to take our stability and happiness for granted, and we're working hard to create a positive, loving environment for Emma.